We've been studying the book of Galatians, and today we're going to talk about through faith in Jesus Christ, and it's uh, because this chapter 2, I mean, maybe we could have done a couple of messages on chapter 2, but, but the primary reason for even his continued argument in the beginning and, uh, of the book and then in the beginning of chapter 2 is, is really because he's trying to defend this idea of being justified by faith through Jesus Christ. And the fact that there were so many people looking to add on to that or, or change it or corrupt it in some way. Uh, we talked early on when we first started the study of Galatians that it was about defending the simple gospel, not the gospel plus that so often can creep in and become a part of what we do and what we say. So today I hope that as we look at this about through faith in Jesus Christ and, and how that applies to our lives and what it should mean to us, I, I pray it's something that really brings us back to a place of, of really appreciating the simple gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's pray and then we'll jump into our lesson for today. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we we're surrounded by a world that so often looks for something more and thinks that good news is too good to be true or, or it's too easy or sometimes it's too difficult. Lord, I pray that today as we study these words that we'll be reminded again of the simplicity of your gospel and the complexity of its cost. Help us, Lord, to remember that what we enjoy did not come freely. It came at a sacrifice of your Son. He has lived the life we needed to live. He's died the death we needed to die. and Now we can claim victory over the grave because of his life. And through faith in Jesus Christ, we can be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Through faith in Jesus Christ. We're going to read these verses. It's Galatians 2. It's 1 through 21. I know it's a large section. We're going to read through them relatively quickly. And then we'll break down kind of the last few verses of chapter 2. And you'll kind of pick up on a common theme. Because like I said, Paul has been defending his apostolic authority and, and his credibility. And not only his credibility, but ultimately the gospel's credibility for the better part of chapter 1 and, and the beginning part of chapter 2. So it's important that we understand this is a continuation of that argument, of defending his apostolic authority. And then he tells us in these verses why he's doing that, why it's important well, that we accept who he is and the message that he's proclaiming. It says, Then after 14 years I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaimed among the Gentiles in order to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. So he wants to make sure that what he's saying and teaching and preaching aligns with what the other apostles know of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved. He wants to preserve the truth of the gospel, so he resists pressures to add something on to the gospel, even when he was in the presence of people who told him that he should. And from those who seemed to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seem influential added nothing to me, meaning they added nothing to the revelation of Jesus Christ that Paul had received. For he worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised, also worked through me for mine to the Gentiles. 
And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, <clears throat> the very thing we were eager to do. But when Cephas came to Antioch, that's Peter, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Which means he was doing everything Paul has been talking about, everything Paul sees in the simple gospel. But when some people came who thought more needed to be added to the gospel, Peter backed up and kind of joined them for a little bit. He wants to call him out on it. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. That statement bears repeating, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a certain servant of sin? For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For if for through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Those are the verses of chapter 2, where he goes from his need to defend this gospel to an explanation of it. He uses a word repeatedly in it, it's called justified. The Greek word is pronounced dikaio or dikio, either one. The 16th century German reformer Martin Luther that, that uh, Ray talked about just a moment ago said, this is the truth of the gospel, justified by faith in Jesus Christ. It is also the principal article of all Christian doctrine wherein the knowledge of all good godliness consists. More necessary is it, is it, therefore, that we should know this article well, teach it to others, and beat it into their heads continually. Again, he said, if the article of justification is lost, all Christian doctrine is lost. Most memorable of all, he described it as the Articulus Stantus Vel Candidus Ecclesia, which is just the article of faith that decides whether the church is standing or falling. It means all things rest on the doctrine of justification through faith in Jesus Christ. That if those things, if that ever falls, all Christian doctrine will cease to be real or justified in believing it. Deuteronomy 25.1 says, 
if there is a dispute between men and they come into court and the judge decides between them, acquitting the innocent and condemning the guilty. And really, I only put that in there because the acquitting that it talks about there is a very particular word. It's also a very similar word to the word justified that's used in the Greek. In the Greek version of the Old Testament, it's the exact same word. And it means that once we're justified, we're found innocent. Not simply that we're just cleared of guilt. We're found innocent. We've been acquitted, justified through faith in Jesus Christ. Proverbs 17, 15 says, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. So this is not just simply the fact that we are written off, sin is written off, but sin has been paid for. It's not a judge who's just declaring a guilty person somehow innocent with no sacrifice, no blood, no anything. We are justified through the blood of Jesus Christ. A sacrifice had to be paid for everything that we've done, for everything that I've done. He wasn't going to just overlook my sin. That's what this passage is really pointing at, that if we had a judge who simply overlooked sin, he would be an abomination. We have one that justifies us because the sacrifice, the debt, has been paid. And the debt has been paid in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We know that God is a right judge. He will clear the innocent and he will punish the guilty. We need a way to be made right before God because when we stand on our own merit before God, we are not innocent. We are guilty before God, every single one of us. So how do we become made right with God? Paul argues that it is faith in Christ and not works that lead to our justification. I think the reason why churches struggle with this is because of these two words, license and legalism. License, it's like a loopholes. I posted a picture of the definition of loopholes on, on uh, Facebook earlier today, but a loophole is just an escape, a way to get around a rule. I mean, as a kid, I looked for every loophole in the world to get out of my parents' restrictions for whatever it was they were going to put on me. But here we have kind of a flip side of looking for loopholes. For centuries, the Israelites had been looking for loopholes around the law, ways that they could circumvent the law, ways that they could fulfill the law without having to fulfill the law. Some escape from the punishment that they knew was coming because they knew they weren't upholding the law. Then, all of a sudden, Christ comes along, which was their loophole. He's standing right in front of them, the way that they can escape punishment for their sin, and they ignore it. And now here we are, the church, who has Christ as our, our, our provision, our way to, cry, to the, the, the Lord, to be reconciled, the way to be forgiven for our sins. And we're always looking for a loophole too. Well, I, I know that it says just trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ, but don't we have to do something more? Isn't there some loophole here that we need to be watching out for? Or maybe I could earn some better position for myself. Some return to merit. Because if I can do that, then I'm better than you. And maybe I don't need Christ as much as you. We look for loopholes. They did it too. They fulfilled the law, some of them, Pharisees, Sadducees, leaders of the Jewish religion. They thought they were adhering to the law all the time. They walked in lockstep with one another and they looked down on everybody else because of the fact that they were these ultra-religious people. Now here we are, we see this perfect free gift of the blood of Jesus Christ that's going to save us from our sins, and we say to ourselves, well, that's great for me, but why? I need to be better than those people over there. I can't just be on the same playing field. And suddenly we start to become the Pharisees on the other side. Yes, Jesus Christ saves us. Yes, the blood of Christ is what 
washes us clean. We just talked about it in our Bible study this morning in Revelation 7 where they dip their robes in blood of Christ and pull them up white. They're made white because the sins are forgiven. Their sins are washed away in the blood of Christ, but somewhere in the back of our heads we still have this idea that there's some earning ability or some earn, there's something in us that should be able to build on what Christ has done. We want to add to it, so we take the simple gospel and we add circumcision. We add attendance. We add tithing. We add whatever it is. And the whole reason we're adding those things is looking for loopholes. Just in case Christ wasn't enough. Just in case standing before God and saying, I am washed in the blood of Christ wasn't enough. I can also say, well, you know, I attended, I had a great, I had a perfect attendance record in Sunday school where I had a I went to a church that only used this particular translation or only sang that type of music. Whatever it is, we take the gospel and we start adding to it, looking for the loophole that will somehow exalt us. Because the idea for sinful people to simply exalt the Lord is foreign. We just can't do it. We cannot look at a single Savior and say, that was enough for me. So as a result, we get license or we get legalism. We get license and we think, well, you know, Christ died for us. He covered all of our sin. That means I can go do whatever I want to do. Whenever I want to do it, it doesn't matter. And then when people get too far down that direction, then we start becoming legalistic to try to correct that path. And then when we get too legalistic, we start celebrating license again. And we go back the other direction. And all the while, it's because we struggle to accept the simple doctrine of justification in Jesus Christ alone. That's why Paul talks about how when we're young, we're blown to and fro by every wind of doctrine. It's not always doctrine that takes us away from Lord, the Lord. Sometimes it's just simply doctrine that either pushes us to a place where we're bringing discredit to the Lord or a place where we're imposing undue burden in the name of the Lord. Paul addresses this in more than one place, not only in the place back in Galatians where we just read where he says, should we do this sin? And he says, certainly not. He says it in Romans 6, 1 and 2, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Meaning, should we sin more so grace just gets bigger and bigger and bigger? And he says, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in sin? So justification through faith in us is supposed to produce something. There's supposed to be something that comes out of that that reflects the fact that we are truly forgiven, restored, reconciled to Christ. The old has passed away and the new has come. Something in us has died and now something else is alive. And in Paul, he says, I have died and it is now Christ who lives in me. And that's what's supposed to come through the lives of believers. The problem, though, is not the restrictions that we place on our religion. It's where we find our roots in religion. If your roots are in accomplishment, in merit, in deserving, in all of these things, you will most likely either become extremely legalistic or extremely licentious. But if your roots are in Jesus Christ, then you become, as you grow in that, and you understand who you are, who you were, and what you can become in Him, you will begin to glorify Him more and more and more because you realize you deserve no glory. He deserves all the glory. To live in sin means that we excuse it or write it off or find some way to forgive ourselves for it without achieving forgiveness through Christ. 
So he says, by no means am I saying sin more so grace can abound more. James 1.22 says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. It starts to sound like we're creeping back into legalism, but that's not at all James's intent. James's intent is real faith produces something. That's why Paul says, you will know them by their fruit. Why Jesus tells us we will recognize them in the same way. Romans 2.13 says, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law. When we deal with the fact that we sometimes hear things and don't do them, it's important that we understand that it doesn't, it's like a, we were having a conversation at staff meeting the other day, and I think it was Ray that said, I know that if I eat right and exercise, I'll be skinny. That's a belief that hasn't produced that result just yet. Yeah, not trying to call you out, Ray, I promise I'm not. But the point is, is our belief in Jesus Christ that type of belief? Because if it is, the Bible would tell you that's not the faith you need. You do not need a knowledge of Christ. You need a faith in Him. You need to believe that Christ was enough. That He didn't die in vain. Because if you could somehow add to what He's done, then His sacrifice was either insufficient or insignificant. neither of which should be anything we as believers want to proclaim. Rob Gallaty said one time that the reason why it's important that we actually live out our lives is because your lips can lie, but your lifestyle never does. What we say we would believe, but we can see that in people. I spoke a couple weeks ago about the fact that if I said I loved Carmen, but then no one ever heard me talk of her, no one ever saw her in real life, no one ever saw her in my life, no one ever saw pictures of us together, never heard me congratulate her on anything, why would they ever believe that? So license and legalism seem to be overcorrections for a basic problem. We're planted in the wrong soil. We're trying to grow from the wrong place. Grow from a faith in Jesus Christ and you will reflect the fruit of the Spirit. Because you'll have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. No matter what you do apart from that, you will never bear fruit for the Lord. You have to begin from a place of faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Saving faith produces godly attributes. Godly attributes do not produce saving faith. You know what they produce? They produce self-righteousness. They produce an ability or an add-on to the gospel. If you just try to behave in a certain way, and hope that somewhere along the line you will suddenly have faith in Jesus Christ, what you will more likely do is grow in faith of yourself. Begin with faith in Jesus Christ. The quote Rob wrote was this, Your lips can lie, but your life cannot. That's why Paul says, No longer I who live. It is this that makes God's justification of sinners so astonishing. For the very thing that He condemns in others, He Himself does. The righteous God, though He is, justifies the ungodly. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He finds in their favor. He grants them standing before Him 
His holy law of righteousness is given to them through the blood shed on the cross by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He makes them, makes us wholly free from condemnation. He makes us heirs instead of eternal life. Paul defends this gospel so ardently because it is the entirety of the gospel. We are justified through faith in Jesus Christ. It's one of the reasons why part of the three of the five solas are by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. If my deliverance relies on anything I have done, I am lost. Place your faith in the person and work of Christ. Galatians 2.16 says, Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. We grew up in a culture around us that says things like, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. And, no such thing as a free lunch. God helps those who help themselves. You do realize that's not in the Bible, right? It's, it's not in there. God does not help those who help themselves. God helped those who were incapable of helping themselves. We have a God who loved us enough to pay the price we could never pay, to give us a forgiveness we could never earn in a person of Jesus Christ who did not deserve what happened to him. I hope today you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ because we are justified through faith in him alone.